they would know not to do that. Don't, don't, look. don't look. And so we have all of those things going on. And then the biggest thing is that when you're a tour guide, and their, their English was somewhat good, but not great, that you have to you tell them, stay close, right? Number one thing, stay close. Now I'm going to tell you a story that just happened to my wife. She's telling me this story, and I go, it's pretty typical of uh, my wife's family. It really is. But Borgny organizes this trip. Going to go to Christian's son. You know, and it, it's all adults are all going, and, you know, the only thing that, you know, she was saying is stay close, and it's not a big deal. You know, she feels very safe there, so she made everybody else feel really safe there. It's not like going to Manhattan. So here's, the, here's where it goes. They're going down one of the main strips, the streets in, in Norway, and Borgny was leading. And you know when you go to a new place that you're looking around, it's like, oh, they're beautiful. look at all these beautiful shops, all this stuff. So they just keep walking. And then all of a sudden they get to the corner to cross the street and they're looking around and go, where's Borgny? Now that's a first. Normally the tour guide is the one looking for somebody from the pack that got lost. Now the people that were being on this tour are looking for Karen's cousin. Where, what, what happened? She's gone. Where'd she go? And here's a neat story. They turn around, and they can see way down uh, by the other the street that they crossed a while ago, they see Borgny sitting on the, the sidewalk talking to a homeless person. Just, and you have to, you, now all of a sudden, you know, my wife is like, what? You know, so now they have to go back, you know, what's going on here? You know, this was very strange for her, you know, and all of them, what, you know, what is she, she doing? Here's a part of the story I want you to hear, because we're going to go back to this a couple times. When they were, they didn't really notice a homeless person resting on the front of a building on the sidewalk. Now, I wonder if you've ever had that, that you've been so busy with your plans and all the things you want to do and see, that you don't even notice the things around you, especially the people that are around you. Well, that was true for my wife and for her, her cousins and my son, that, you know, they're just too busy with all the excitement and everything that was new. They went right past. That person just seemed to melt into the bigger picture. They just weren't there. But for Borgny, she saw the person right away and was moved in such a way that she decided to leave the family and to go back and to sit with the person. Now, you might think that's a little strange, but maybe you think it's a really cool thing. But my wife goes on to tell me she didn't just sit there for a moment. They had to wait for Borgny. She didn't just talk. She listened. And she listened to this person's story. And after he was done telling his story, Borgny then reached in her pocket, pulled out some money, and gave it to this gentleman. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think was more valuable to that homeless person? The money that was just put into their hand or the time taken to hear their story? What do you think? The time, right? I want to talk about that. Because the way that we treat time is the way we show compassion. Many of us right now do not show compassion because we're too busy. We are just way, way, way too busy. When I worked in the city, I even lived in the city for a little while, I got so used to all of the people, the street people, you know, that were there, that I didn't really notice them. I didn't, I didn't even hear them asking for money anymore. That's how bad it was. Because the only thing I was thinking about, I got to make the train, and I got to go uptown, and I got to do some work, and I got this here and that, that I just didn't see them. But more than that, I really didn't have care in my heart. I'm being honest. I had bigger things to do. I had places I had to be. I had business to run. There was a lot of things going on. And I just didn't have the heart nor the vision to see those around me who were hurting. And I wonder today how many people are so busy with their own agendas and their plans that they don't have time to listen to the hurting. 
Now, I'm looking around because there's an illustration I used during Holy Week, and I want to use a little bit of it again because it was a God moment for my wife and I, a very special moment. Every now and then, I like to go out to eat with my wife. We go over locally. We go to Squires. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy that because the TVs are in the bar, I want to sit there. So we sit at the bar and have our dinner. And it's really nice because usually Karen and I get to sit next to each other. We eat. We could watch the sports and that kind of thing. So it's good. I'm having a good time. Until that one day, I left the church here. I told my wife, it's, you know, it's a, well, I call it the early bird special. We go get our food, and we'll be happy. Watch TV. As soon as we sat down, we're together. There's a woman next to my wife and a man next to me. Now, for those of you that have heard the story, I apologize. You're just going to have to listen to it again, okay? But the story goes this way, and it's true. My wife is sitting next to this woman and sees she's crying. So my first reaction is, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're interrupting my food, you know, but okay. She's crying, and she has pictures laid out on the bar, pictures. So my wife, the one with the heart in my family, asked her, what, is everything okay? And the woman shared with my wife that it was the anniversary of her son's death committed suicide. And this every year, she would go to there because that's where her and her son would go to have time together. And she had no one. No one. And so she's crying to my wife. My wife is listening. I'm sitting there going, okay. There's a guy next to me. And you know, God is funny because he can take a cranky guy like me and just make matters worse. You know, it's bad enough I can't talk to my wife. I'm not spending any time with her. This woman is taking all of her time. This guy starts crying next to me. I'm thinking they're together. Maybe he is having a hard time because it's his son too. They just don't get along. I don't know. No. So I ask him, everything okay? Don't do that. Because you opened up Pandora's box. And I asked if it's okay. And he goes, oh, yeah, I I'm fine. My wife decided after 40 years she's going to leave me, and she left. 40 years of marriage. But he goes, I'm fine. And he's crying as he's ordering another drink. And so I talked with him a little bit. And, you know, it always goes to, you know, so what do you do? Ah, poo, here we go. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a chaplain in ministry. Oh, th that's religious? Yes, that's religious. By the time we were done, we ate our food while listening to these people. And I thought leaving there that it, we accomplished nothing. I want you to think about this a moment. That we've accomplished nothing. Because all we did was sit there and listen. But then my wife made it clear it was a God moment. Why? Because there was no one sitting on either side of those two people but us. They would have been left in their sorrow all alone. But God decided to have my wife and I be there to listen to take time, to show some compassion. Now, I want to tell you, sometimes showing compassion doesn't mean you fix somebody else's problem. Sometimes it's just caring. Caring. And that is a story we'll forever tell because it was unbelievable that not only was my wife brought in, but I was brought in to two different strangers at the same time. And all they needed was attention. That's all they needed. We live in a society that's extremely narcissistic. We're so self-centered, self-focused, it's amazing. They say that because of that today, volunteerism is down, compassion is down, caring is down, all of these things, giving is down, all of that, not in the church. I'm talking about in other agencies. We focus so much on ourselves that we really don't care about the people around us. We just don't care because we're number one. 
And that's sin. That's sin inside our hearts. The next is one I'm very familiar with. When you see someone that's hurting, they could be homeless, they could be having a terrible situation, maybe a bad relationship, maybe they got into big trouble. Why is it instead of showing compassion, we blame them for their own circumstance? What is it about us? Well, why don't they get a job? You ever hear somebody say that? Why doesn't that homeless person get a job? Okay, what's he going to put down for his address? 102 dumpster behind store? Really? Um, Oh, yeah, and what's your social security number? Mm. How do you start when you have no credit score? Or worse, you have a, a terrible one. How do you begin again? Sometimes the challenges are so great, you can't begin again by yourself. And that's why God calls us to care. He calls us to show compassion. Because there are some people that are in so deep, they can't get out by themselves. But to blame somebody, well, it's their fault. Oh, that fixes everything, doesn't it? But I know people that say that. Well, they can get a job. Well, you know, why, you know, oh, come on, there's plenty of government agencies. I have to tell you something. As much as people think the government's going to help, if you've ever had a loved one that you had to go and get paperwork for from a government agency, don't tell me it's a help. When my mom was sick and, and needed assistance, and I went to do the paperwork for her, it took three trips, and it still didn't pass. Filling out paperwork, waiting in line. And how do they get there? They don't have a car. They don't have money for an Uber. You see what I mean? People they need someone to come alongside. And my favorite is expecting someone else to take care of it. In our society today, we really are starting to trust more in the government than in God using us. We believe that the government is going to fix all the ills. We think that they're going to take care of the poor, going to take care of all those with health conditions, going to be there for all of that. Well, if that were true, why do we have so many people that are homeless? Why are there so many people that have nothing? People that don't have the hope. They're all alone. Because really, that's not the government's job. It's our job as Christians. We're supposed to see the needs, and we're supposed to respond, and we're supposed to show the love of Christ, and we're supposed to care. But maybe we've gotten a little too worldly in our faith, a little too calloused. Time to soften up. What I love is when we're supposed to pray, create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Maybe our hearts have become calloused, and maybe today is a great day of confessing, Lord, my heart has gone cold. I don't love as you love. I don't love my neighbor as I love myself. I need you to change my heart today, Lord Jesus. And I truly believe that the Lord can change our hearts. Change them in a moment to where we went from being cold to caring. I really believe that. And there's another thing. When I was in the city, I always noticed, you know, people, like tourists, they'd see somebody homeless, and they, they just throw the money into like a bucket or a can or whatever it is they have, you know, for their thing. And just keep walking. They didn't even look at the person. They just throw money in it. Caring isn't just throwing money at something. You know, sometimes we've disconnected ourselves from really caring. We think that as long as I send a check, as long as I just give them some money, oh, I'm good. What's connected with the check? For most, Nothing. It's just money that'll be spent. Isn't it better if you're connected to that gift? You're going to hear more about that in a little bit too. So what does Jesus teach us about this? Caring and having compassion. Luke 10. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself 
So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by to the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Jesus asked, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now that story is really rich because the, the story is really about a Jew that was robbed and his own people didn't help him. And a Samaritan, who the Jews were enemies with because they weren't considered equal with Jews, is the one that went and did all of this for the person that would be, in a sense, an enemy, somebody, a stranger, somebody you don't work with and you don't care about. What a great lesson. See, it goes past all the lines we draw caring. We don't care because they're like us. We don't care because they, they live like we do. We care because they're in need. That's what this is all about. Showing compassion... It begins with seeing the needs of others. We need to ask God to open our eyes so that we can see. Showing compassion is more than feeling sorry for someone. It's having concern for the hurting. Showing compassion is taking time to listen. I learned that firsthand. And showing compassion is doing something, not just having pity. And today, I want to share with you what you can do to show compassion to those who are in need. Today is our opportunity. It's called Compassion Sunday by Compassion International. This is a way that we can show compassion to those who are in need around the world. If you look at these pamphlets when you go, you're going to notice that they take care of four different areas. Central America, South America, Africa, and Asia. And it lists all the different places within that they are able to help. You can see that the help is bigger than just caring for a child. You're talking about children that are being put into trafficking, into drugs, in, into being, being used and being made slaves. I mean, this is really tough for them. And with them, as you heard in the video, they have no hope. Their parents are the ones telling them that they're worthless. And that's what happens. Now they're on the street. This is an opportunity to change that for just one. Just one young person. This is more than just sending a check. It's getting involved. You're going to notice when you go to the table outward, Dave is, you're going to see letters that are sent back and forth. You can have communication with the child in which you sponsor that you can see what's going on. What are they learning? That's incredible. It's not just cutting a check and moving on, but you're getting involved in their life. You're caring. And when you start getting a letter, you know what you're doing. You're praying for them. You are now spiritually connecting to that child that you sponsor. Through personal letters, you'll find that you build a great relationship, you receive information, and you're encouraged that your money is one of the best investments you can make because you're investing in a person and investing in their future. Remember that this is more than just meeting a physical need. Compassion International is a Christian organization. That means that they are teaching young people the love of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice made on their behalf and Jesus going to the cross, paying for all of our sins 
giving us hope and promise of eternal life. But more than that, when you're alone in this world, you are told that you're not alone because the Lord Jesus Christ walks with you and is present with you. And when you have that hope, you can endure hardship because you know you're not facing it alone. And I want you to think about this. They have medical needs. They're able to be taken care of. They have needs of food and physical care. They're being taken care of. They're being taught things that they wouldn't be taught because they weren't able to go to school. These are important things for them to survive and to be able to flourish later on. All those things are provided by you being a sponsor. And a child will have a chance instead of being thrown on the street. My sermon was to open your eyes that caring is not just people around the world. We can care right at home too because we have a problem. We have a lot of hurting people. Drug abuse is huge. Suicide is huge. We have people that are hurting all around us. We have people that are lonely. We can spend time. We can come alongside. And we can help. So when you're thinking about, Lord, what would you have me do? Maybe today he's calling you to support a child. God bless. Maybe he's saying, listen to my voice when you're out in the world. I'm going to call you to someone. I'm going to set up an opportunity for you. Be willing to take the time to do the ministry. That's compassion. So may we all learn something today. Our God has shown us such compassion. Though we continue to sin daily, He continues to forgive us daily.